Hey, what's going on folks? It's Mike here and welcome to the next lesson in the C++ series. In this lesson, we're going to continue talking about classes in C++, diving a little bit deeper into some of the nitty gritty details so you can learn about constructors and destructors. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at some code. So I'm going to go ahead and start us off just by reviewing what we did last time. So let me go ahead and just make this a little bit bigger so you can read here um, and see what's going on. So left to right, starting from this window pane, moving over to the other window panes. I want to show you the code that was in a previous lesson. If you didn't watch that lesson, go ahead and watch that or just pick up from here. But the basic idea is we were able to create a new user defined type student that's included in this .h file here called student.hpp. That would be this middle file here, uh, which I'm highlighting in this pane so you can see the actual class here. And we created two instances of objects, Mike and Sue. And we changed one of the member variables here, Mike here, because, well, it was public and we're allowed to do that if the scope is public. And then we called one of the associated member functions here or the actions on Mike here called print name. And we can find the actual implementation of print name in the CPP file, which actually implements this function. So we can see the print name function, the scope which it's found in, which is student colon colon, that's over here, and how to exactly print things out. Now, in the last lesson, we also learned about these things called constructors and destructors. So these are what I want to talk a little bit more about the, in this lesson. And in C++ or really any object-oriented programming language, we at the least need some sort of constructor that tells us how do we create this object. And that is what initialization steps are going to take place. And here we're just printing out the constructor um, or C out and then printing out the text constructor here. So we're not really doing any meaningful work. Behind the scenes, what C++ is likely doing is allocating enough memory for our member variables and then returning our object to us. Okay, so that's what's happening at line four when our constructor is called and line eight. Now, what happens though if we don't have a destructor? So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm going to go ahead and just clear this code so we can just look at our classes and I'm going to go ahead and get rid of our destructor and constructor and I'll just get rid of all of this as well okay because there's no implementation here that's needed and if I go ahead and recompile our program well it actually compiles and if I run it well we'll get a printout here printing out the names of our two classes that are created and just so you can have I guess in your uh, memory what's going on here in main um you know this is the code that we are actually running here all right so what exactly is going on how are we able to get away with this because i just said you need a constructor that tells c plus plus what happens when the object is created and a destructor when these objects leave their scope or are otherwise deleted so here's the reality of what's going on behind the scene so for classes we get a default constructor and a default destructor. And that's always provided to us for free in the C++ programming language. Again, the reason being that, well, we have to construct this object somehow. And C++ will provide us with a default constructor and a default destructor. That is a destructor and or rather a constructor that doesn't take any parameters and a boring old uh, destructor that also um, does not take any parameters. In fact, it never does. Um, so that's what C++ will give us. Now we can override those constructors and destructors so that something happens. So in fact, we just got you know no output here. But if I undo my constructor and destructor here and bring them back into the code here, and if I rerun this by recompiling and running, well, now we can see that this is the actual constructor that is being called. So that is often what we do in C++ because we want some series of actions or an algorithm or something to actually run here. So for example, let's go ahead and modify uh, our class a little bit. 
And what I'm going to go ahead and do here um, is just go ahead and initialize our constructor. But I want to initialize one of our variables. And I'm just going to say that the name is no name here. OK, constructor. And let's just go ahead and have another printout here that says um, no or M name is and we'll just print it out here and name like this. So you can see how I'm adding some different behaviors or maybe some things that I would want to do with this actual constructor here. So let's go ahead and run our code. And I'll recompile, rerun. And now you can see whenever our constructor is called, we have M name is no name. And we have initialized or stored in this string here, M name, which is part of our class, this just default value here. That way we've at least initialized all of our variables, which is often a good thing to do in C++. Now, eventually I do just rename my instances here as I'm doing uh, in the code here. And you can see that I'm just assigning this variable a specific name here. Now, our destructor in C++ doesn't take any parameters. There's nothing that we really have to do here. OK, so let me go ahead and get rid of a little bit of this uh, noise here just to make things a little bit uh, cleaner here. And what I want to show you, so I'm going to go ahead and just get rid of um, Sue here and just have one object that's created, is that we can have different types of constructors. Because the destructing step's really going to be uniform. It's going to take care of deleting any dynamically allocated memory or just any cleanup or you know logging that we would want to do in our programs. But oftentimes when we construct objects, we might want to construct them differently. So for example, I can create another constructor here that when called sets up the name of our object here. OK, so what I'm going to go ahead and do is create another constructor by copying this. The function signature needs to match, so it needs a string here for name. And because I'm using string in this file, it's appropriate to include the string library, although that's already brought in here. Um, so this should compile. Now, what I'm going to do here at line 12 is assign m name to, well, the argument here, name that is passed in. And let's go ahead and see when this constructor is called, what happens. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and compile. And if I run this, we'll ask if there's going to be any change here. Uh, well, we have our constructor. M name is no name. Oh, hmm. OK, I called the wrong constructor when constructing my object. So <laughs> and I did that on purpose, I promise. Uh, what I'm going to have to do here at line four is call the right constructor. How do I do that? Well, I call the function with the parameter here. So let me go ahead and do that. So let's go ahead and just set the name to Mike. And in fact, just to prove that this is working, I'm going to get rid of the line uh, that is right here where I assign the name here. OK, so let's go ahead and save that. And I'll recompile. I'll rerun. You can see our constructor is called M name is it's printed out Mike. And then our print name function is doing the right thing. It's printing our name. And then our destructor gets printed out uh, as needed. So pretty cool that that's actually working uh, all there. And in a sense, we've also cleaned up the design of our class a little bit. And this is probably bugging folks who have been doing some Java programming. They're saying, hey, Mike, why are you exposing maybe this super secure variable here? Now I can actually just make this private. And then we don't need to expose or someone can't accidentally change what the name is in our program. So again, I'll recompile it so you can see it works and rerun it here. So again, this is a way to create another uh, constructor. So there might be multiple ways that we want to construct an object. Typically, a good practice is to always initialize your member variables to something in your constructors. And if I really wanted to, I could create other helper functions, maybe private ones that help initialize some data in these constructors. That might be something you see in various code bases. Now, I'm not going to get to it as much here because I think I'm 
throwing or adding enough information into this lesson here. But something you might look at in modern C++ is initialize our lists as another quick way to initialize member variables that again are things like m underscore name or your data variables here. And that's something I'll eventually do in other lessons or you might see me do it. So with that said, folks, I want to uh, thank you again for taking a look at this lesson. I hope it was helpful. And now you understand a little bit that we get these default constructors and default destructors for free if we do not provide them. Typically, we do end up overriding them in many cases, and we'll talk about why we may or may not want to do that. And in fact, not only do we get default constructors and destructors in our code, we actually get default copy constructors and things that will help with move semantics. So for folks who have seen those lessons in the past where we talk about copying things and move semantics, uh, we'll bring those into classes very, very soon. But in order to make sure that you do see those lessons, you have to make sure that you like and subscribe this video so that you don't miss those future lessons. <laughs> anyway, thanks for your time, folks, and we'll see you soon.